Hey, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? Hey, let me tell you a little something about me to start off. Tonight's going to go really well if you talk back to me. Okay, okay. Grady knows, okay. Um, I used to be on staff at a black church. Um, that, that's a true story. Um, and I was like the only white dude there, and um, that's a true story as well. Well, we used to have this lady that whenever I preached, her name was Miss Green. And she would sit right here. Tell me your name again. Chloe. She'd sit right here where Chloe sat. And every time I preach, she would make this face. Now, I'm white, so I thought like maybe she'd got a bad mint or something. But like she would always go like this. She'd go. <clears throat> and at first, I was like, what? are you choking? Are you, did, did someone spit in your water? But th- then she told me, she's like, no, no, no it's because you're preaching fire. And I thought, oh, okay. So here's the thing. If I start preaching fire, y'all know what well, y'all Know what I mean when I say fire? If I, a bunch of white kids. Okay, listen. If I say something that's really swell and, and neat, right, and you agree with it, I need you to give me a... <clears throat> okay, so let's all practice. Okay, so on the count of three, I need everyone to give me a Miss Green. Okay, ready? One, two, three. I don't know what happened back there. It sounded like a cat got stepped on or something. I don't... Let's try that again. Ready? One, two, three. <clears throat> Hey, but all joking aside, I'm excited to be here. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Nathan. I am a pastor. I'm from Big Spring, Texas. Anybody know where Big Spring is? Yeah, okay. All right, cool. Um, and I get to do this for a living. I just travel and, and get, get to preach, um, and I get to uh, do this for a living, and I, and I love doing it. Um, just to, like I said, to tell you a little bit about me, I have a beautiful wife. Uh, yes, that's right. That is right. And um, her name is Kimberly. And uh, something cool about her is we have the same birthday. We were born on the same day. Um, what, I thought it would be really cool because I thought, you know what, now I'll never forget her birthday. But what stinks about it is now I no longer have a birthday. Y- y'all get it? Like, it's just her day. Because um, she's uh, selfish. Um, anyways, so, no, but she's fine. Like, for real, I'm going to talk a little bit about her here in a little bit. We have uh, three kids. Um, our oldest, her name is Marin. Um, and literally, she's the most perfect kid ever. I know parents are like supposed to, supposed to say that about their kids, but she really does nothing wrong. It's weird. Except for the other day, um, we were sitting and watching uh, TV, and uh, some song came on, and we were just, you know, sitting there hanging out, and all of a sudden, I see her little hands go up, and I think she's like worshiping, right? We had some worship music on. I thought, oh yeah, she's encountering God. And I look over at her, and she was throwing up the Illuminati sign. And I was like, what? It's like, what is... Some of y'all don't know. Okay, Google it. Don't Google it. You'll spend like 11 hours on Google, and it's, it's bad. So we have uh, Marin. Then we have a uh, middle child. Uh, she's three. Her name is Austin. And um, let me just tell you something about Austin. Um, she is not saved. Okay? She may have a demon. I, I'm not sure. Like, I'm, like, I'm not sure. Um, she just is it's kind of a bully. I kind of like it about her because she doesn't take junk from anyone else. And um, she's really chubby. She's a real chubby baby. <laughs> So she, like, doesn't walk, she waddles, like, all through the house. And, uh, so, and then we have a little boy. Um, his name is Chip. And uh, he's just the coolest dude ever. Right now he's in this phase where he doesn't want to come and give me a hug. Uh, when he goes to bed, he comes and gives me a chest bump. But he's little, so it's like a calf bump, you know? He comes up to my calf, and he's like, ugh. And then he, he like, walks off like he's all big. Um, so they're super cute. Um, I wish they could be here, but they're, they're in Big Spring tonight. Um, For those of you who don't know, I went to a school called Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry. Um, My friends while I was there were Harry, Ron, and Hermione. Let me all get it. Nerds. Okay. Um, So I went all the way out there to get my training, uh, learned some cool things. Watch, someone will get it here in about five minutes. You'll start laughing. You'll be like, Harry, Ron, and Hermione. I get it. Harry Potter. Um, But in all honesty, I'm excited to be here. I was telling Adam... um, this last month, I've just been all over the place getting, getting to preach. But I told Adam, and it's not just because he is one of my best friends. I really feel this in my spirit. I feel like all the events I've done this past month have led up to this one. Right? So I, and, I, and I kept telling him this. I said, I, the word I keep getting is, is just special. There's something that's going to happen tonight that's special. So turn to your neighbor and say, something's going to happen tonight. Turn to your, turn to your other neighbor and say, it's going to be special. Hey, you got your Bibles? Hey, you got your Bibles? Hey, y'all hush, y'all are cutting into my time. 
Hey, Genesis 3. Genesis chapter 3. We're going to be in a couple places. We're going to read Genesis 3 here at the beginning, and then here at the end we're going to turn to John. So let's start in Genesis 3. Can I tell you a story? I grew up, I live in La Mesa, or I live in Big Spring, but I grew up in a town called La Mesa. Okay, and when I grew up, um, I have what, what, what you would call uh, rebellion issues. Anybody? Like I was the kid who, if my mom told me not to touch the stove because it was hot, I would touch the stove. And I never got out of that phase. Like my wife still tells me to do things, and I'm like, mm, this is a trick. And so I have to do them. So I, I always seem to learn through consequence instead of advice. Um, so I was that way when I was younger. And um, we grew up, we had this really big house, and um, we had all these trees in our backyard. And my dad told me, he said, Nathan, you can climb any of these trees, except for this one. This one was too big. It was the biggest tree in our yard. He said, you, any of these trees you can, you can climb, just don't climb this one. And so like a good son, I said, yes, yes, Father, I will obey your commandment. And how many of you know what happened the second my dad walked in the house? Right, okay. So if you can imagine me at the age of five on Kool-Aid. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's Kool-Aid is water with sugar. A bunch. Of, okay. Um, so, um, so the second he was in the house, I got up in the tree. Now here's the thing. Getting up in the tree wasn't hard. Right? The hard part wasn't getting up it. The hard part was trying to get out of it. See, I'm already preaching and you didn't hear it. The, the problem wasn't getting in it. The problem was when I decided to get out of it. And so some things in life are that way. It's, it's easy getting into something, but the problem comes when you try to step out of it. And so I did what any normal five-year-old boy would do once I realized that I could not... No, I didn't jump. I wasn't suicidal. <laughs> what in the world? I said, you jumped! No, it was a tall tree. I just told you. Um, so no, I did what any five-year-old uh, would do, and I screamed like a girl. Right? And so I'm um, the baby of the family. Any babies? Yeah. Okay, we're the most loved, we know. Um, so um, I was the, the baby. So I, I, I started screaming like a little girl, and my older, wiser brother comes out of the house. Okay? And so what he's trying to do from the bottom of the tree is he's telling me where to put my hand to get out of the tree. So he's like, okay, you put your right hand here and put your left hand here. And I'm like, bro, this is not the hokey pokey. I'm trying to get out of the tree. Um, so it didn't work, and so what I do is I just start screaming more. So what had to happen, listen to me students, okay, listen. What had to happen was my dad had to step out of his house, he climbed the tree, picked me up, and pulled me out of it. Listen, my brother came to give me relief, but my father came to give me rescue. See, there's a difference between relief and rescue. And in order for someone to rescue you, they have to physically step out of their situation and step into yours. Okay. Oh, there it was. Grady told me. Grady told me somebody would say it. So here's the thing. Here's what I want to talk to you about uh, tonight. Here's the, the title of my sermon. It's called Curses to Crowns. Curses to Crowns. Can we pray before I get started? And when I say let's pray, I don't want you just to listen to me because that's my prayer. I want us to pray together. I know it's radical. Um, but when I pray, I want you to encounter the Lord on your own, okay? So let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for tonight. God, I pray for every student, every adult in this room um, that's here. God, I pray, God, for a powerful move of the Holy Spirit. God, we thank you that every curse has been already broken. God, we thank you again that every curse has been broken through your work. God, open up our eyes, open up our ears to what you're saying, to what you're doing. And God, more than anything, we pray that you would not allow LeBron James to win another title. Amen. Okay. Hey, listen. He's a flopper. Okay, look. If you are in your uh, Bible, Genesis 3. Pastor Mark, this is a gigantic thing. What is, what is this called? A podium. I feel, whoo. I feel legit up here. All right, Genesis chapter 3, let's look. So we're going to pick it up. This is a real familiar story, okay? Um, uh, story of Adam and Eve, story of creation. Um, what happened was um, God created everything. He said everything is good. He said you can do anything, but don't do this one thing, right? He said you can eat from all the fruit um, that comes from all these trees, but he says there's just one tree that you can't get in the middle of, right? And so Adam the Adam we're reading about and that Adam over there had a rebellion issue, right? So he's just like, I, like we were. The one, the, the one thing that he couldn't do is the one thing he wanted to do. So he eats from the tree 
And what happens was, as a result of that sin, there was a curse. Okay, now let's read it. I'm picking it up um, in verse uh, 17. Now he cursed um, the serpent, he cursed the woman, and then he cursed the man. Just for the sake of time, I want to pick up on what he says to the man here. It says this. This is God talking. He says, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten the tree from which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Okay, so the other day my wife was telling me to, t- to take out the trash, and I tried to use this verse on her. I was like, no, listen, because one time this man listened to his wife, and the whole earth got cursed. And, and, and then she punched me in the face, and I cried a little bit and took out the trash. Um, so look at this. It says, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I have commanded you, you shall not eat. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Now watch this. Here's we go. Here we go. Verse 18. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Okay, I want you to, students, I want you to think with me. I want you to look deeper than what it's saying here. Okay? By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground um, for where you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall uh, return. Here's one thing you've got to understand. There are always consequences for rebellion. Right? We live in a generation where rebellion is almost like this trendy thing, like it's almost trendy to rebel against things. But let me tell you, rebellion always has consequences. Right? We see this. Adam rebelled, and there was a consequence. And some of you are probably thinking, if you're anything like me, well, God, if you're good, then why didn't you just like, let him get away with it? Because if you would have let him get away with it, he wouldn't have been good. And that's something I didn't understand until I had my first kid. Right? I didn't understand, man, my dad, how many of your dads ever say this whenever they're, they used to get spankings? Um, he'd say, this hurts me more than it hurts you. I was like, you are a dirty liar. That's what I would think in my mind until I became a dad. And I remember the first time I had to spank my kid, um, I cried harder than they did. Like I spanked him and I was trying to be tough and then my voice was all cracking. And I went upstairs to my bedroom and cried. And my wife, my wife walked up there, she's like, what's wrong? I was like, leave me alone. Right? So, listen, a good, there's always a consequence. There's a consequence for your rebellion. And here's the thing. This, I, I learned this uh, a few months back. God will never heal you of the sin you're trying to hide. Listen, I, I, I've had to learn this the hard way multiple times. How many of you ever think, man, if I can just hide it, maybe it'll just go away? Listen, how many of you ever tried to sweep your dirt under the rug? Right? Here's the thing. Here's what you got to understand. Whatever you sweep under the rug will eventually be found out. I'm telling, listen, listen, listen. Whatever you try to hide will eventually come out. It is so much better and so much easier for you to say, man, yeah, I sinned and here it is. A few months ago, I was watching one of my nieces and she got into the, I say watching, I wasn't really, obviously, or this wouldn't have happened, but she got into the nail polish while I was watching her and um, she decided to put it all over her body. Well, I'm a guy, I never wore nail polish, except for that one time, but, you know, God's grace, he forgives. Um, so um, so I, I'm just like, it's nail polish, it comes off skin, it won't be a problem. I didn't know nail polish like, really doesn't come off skin. So I, she's like really fair skinned and so I, what I had to do is I was, rub, I was trying to get it all off and um, they call my nieces call me Nay. They're like, Nay, it hurts, it hurts. And I was like, I'm sorry. And so I put her in the bathtub, and I'm sitting there, and I'm just scrubbing, scrubbing on it. And uh, she kept saying, Nay, it hurts, it hurts. And I said something. I didn't realize it until after I said it. I said, baby, I know it hurts, but sometimes it hurts to get clean. Right? So, so listen, it may not feel good. That sin you're trying to hide may not feel good to bring it out to the open. But let me tell you, God always develops your dirt. I used to be a cocaine addict for almost four years of my life. That was my dirt that I tried to hide from people. And I was a church kid, right? I would sit right here on the front row. You don't have to, you don't have to be out in the world to be, a, uh, to be a, a prodigal, okay? So I was right there on the front row, but I also had a drug addiction. And it wasn't until I realized I can bring that dirt out and God will actually develop it. He'll actually make it a part of your testimony. So now I get to travel and talk about how God set me free from drugs, and almost every time there's a student that will come up and say, I'm struggling with the same thing. What happened? God developed my dirt. Are you tracking with me? Okay, we're going somewhere. Follow me here. Notice this. Your sin doesn't just affect you. He said, cursed is the ground that you're standing on. Now, can you imagine being the ground in this situation? Let's just stop right here. Like the ground's like, bro, I'm already grounded, and now I'm cursed. 
No, no y'all aren't going to laugh at my jokes anymore, okay? That's how tonight's going to go. Turn to Leviticus. No, I'm just kidding. That's a joke. So listen, your sin doesn't just affect you. This is something I'm trying to get some people that are really close to me. I'm trying to get them to understand. Listen, your decisions aren't just about you. Your decisions affect other people. You got little brothers and sisters. Your, your decisions affect them. They affect your parents. They affect the people that watch you want to be like you. Don't be selfish and think it's just about you. Right? So look at this. One more thing. So here Adam is living in this garden, right? And God said, if you eat of this, you'll surely die. So he eats of the fruit. This always used to confuse me because he ate of the fruit and he didn't die. But here's what happened. Through one choice, follow me students. Through one bad choice, Adam turned the garden into a graveyard. Where it was no longer a place of life, but it was a place of death. That's going to be real important here in a minute. Okay? Look at this. So what had to happen? After this, the stage was set, right? Someone had to step in to Adam's situation and rescue him out of it. And so you read the Old Testament and you read about how it just builds up to this father who's willing to step into your situation. Because God uh, didn't just send an army to save you out of your sin. Or y'all know that. He didn't send a delegate. He sent himself in, a, in the form of his son. And so that's where we're going to pick up the story. Here comes Jesus. Jesus was the greatest miracle worker you've ever seen. He was the greatest pastor you've ever seen. Right? There's nobody better than Jesus. You've got to get that. If you don't get anything I say tonight, you've got to get that. There's nobody better than Jesus. And so here comes Jesus on the scene. And uh, you remember Easter? A few, few weeks ago? We're, this is, we're going to revisit Easter for a second. So here's Jesus fixing to be betrayed. Who remembers the name of the guy that betrayed him? Judas, this is a true story. Don't make me laugh. This is true. Um, the other day I was like, Judas was a terrible person and what a terrible name. And I swear to you, there was a kid there that somebody's parents named him Judas. I was like, where's your dad? I want to punch him in the face right now. I didn't, I didn't say that because that'd be violent. Um, but I'm like, okay, nobody's name is Judas in the room. Okay, good. So Judas was a moron, right? Okay, so here comes Judas. And notice this. Notice where Jesus was when he got betrayed. Anybody remember? Uh, oh, a garden. Hmm. Come on, we're going somewhere. So here you are, Jesus in the garden. You know what one of the names for Jesus is? The bread of life. Do you remember when Jesus is praying, he's sweating blood? Watch this. You remember in, in Genesis? It says, by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Here you have the bread of life sweating. You know why he did that? Because he was on his way to the presence of God. He sweat on his way to the presence of God so that you don't have to. Wow. See, this is how I grew up. I grew up, I grew up in a, I almost said it, I grew up in a certain denomination that, you better stop, um, that, that told me the lie that the harder I worked, the more God would love me. So if I didn't read my Bible enough, God was upset with me. If I didn't pray enough, God was, was upset with me. And I viewed God as this, this Zeus up in heaven with a lightning bolt that was, he was ready to like, kill me. Right? And so, um, listen, God's not that way. God loves you right now just as you are. He doesn't love some future version of you. Right? He doesn't, you can't work enough for Him to love you. He loves you because you're a son and daughter. It's not by your effort. It's not by your sweat. Are you getting it? That He loves you. Okay, so here's Jesus, the bread of life, sweating to get to the presence of God. And here comes Judas. Judas walks up to him, and who remembers what he did? Oh, what version? You reading that hood, hood version? He's like, he stabbed him. That's, <laughs> whoa. Um, he kissed him, right? He goes up to him, and he betrayed him with a kiss. Let me tell you this, students. Not everyone that shows you affection is for you. Listen, not, I've learned this... The, the kiss of, it was a kiss of death. Um, I've learned this the hard way multiple times. Not everyone who shows you affection is on your side. Because I know what it's like to get up here and preach, and everyone's thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, only the next week to get a message on Facebook saying you're a heretic and you're going to hell. And I'm like, you were saying amen. I remember you. Right? Listen, not everyone who shows you affection is for you. So here comes Judas, and he betrays Jesus in the garden. 
And you know what Jesus does? Jesus calls him a friend. This blows my mind. Walks up to him, betrays him, and Jesus' first response is to call him a friend. You know what my first response would be? I'm not going to tell you because it's violent. I, I, it wouldn't be to call him a friend. It would be to call him something else, but not a friend. Let me tell you this. Sometimes your greatest betrayals lead to your greatest breakthroughs. Here's Jesus getting betrayed. You know why he wasn't so upset about it? Because he knew where he was going. He knew he had a job to do. And he knew, listen, this betrayal is going to lead eventually to a breakthrough for me. Can I tell you the same thing, students? Maybe you've lost a friend. Maybe you've lost a parent that's betrayed you. Can I tell you that God will use that betrayal and turn it into your breakthrough if you trust him? If you trust him. So Jesus is in the garden, he gets betrayed. And I love this part of the story. There's this guy named Peter. I like Peter because he's always do, he's just doing dumb stuff. Okay, um, Peter is like, oh, it's not going down like this. And so Peter pulls out his sword. And now here's the thing. He either had a really good aim or really bad aim. I can't figure out which one. Because he swings the sword and cuts off a brother's ear. Now, I'm thinking he was aiming for the head, but he was a bad aim. Cuts off his ear. And you know what Jesus did? Jesus reached down, picked up the brother's ear, and put it back on. Jesus, hold on. Picks up the dude's ear and puts it back on the brother's head. You know why he did that? Because Jesus doesn't need your defending. Right here's Peter. He said, I'm going I'm to defend Jesus. How are you going to defend a lion? Jesus is your defender. That's something I had to learn. I can't, listen, not every time you have a critic, not every time you have one of those, does it merit your response. You ever heard a rumor about you? You're like, oh, I'm going to set this straight and I'm going to start telling everybody the truth. Listen, let Jesus defend you. Let the lion show up and roar over your situation because I'm telling you, that works a whole lot better than you trying to defend yourself. So look at this. So he's in the garden. There was a confrontation. So they take him. And here's the thing. They take him to court. Anybody ever been to court? Don't raise your hand. Okay, I oh, busted. Okay, I was, I, I've been to court a few times. I'm not going to lie. So here's what happened is back in Bible times, whenever you stood before royalty, you would always bow a knee, right, out of respect. But you see nowhere in Scripture where Jesus showed up and he bowed a knee. Listen to this. Listen to this. This is good. When you have a heart that is bowed down to Jesus, it won't bow down to anything else. Jesus had a heart that was fully submitted to God. And because it was fully submitted to God, he wasn't going to bow down to anything else. Let me ask you a question. What are you bowing down to that you shouldn't? Tell me think, Nathan, what does that mean? Are you bowing down to fear? Are you bowing down to insecurities? Let me just let me take my armor off and tell you something that I used to struggle with. I used to be a really jealous person. I have a friend who's really famous. Like if I told you his name you would know who he is. And that used to mess with me back in the day. We grew up together. Um, we used to travel together. And man, God just anointed him. And I was too insecure to understand what that really meant. And I remember one day I was sitting in my house. And I was ironing. I don't know what my wife was doing. She wasn't ironing. But, um, so I'm just a joke. It's a joke. Um, <laughs> she's not here. I wouldn't say it if she was here. So I'm sitting there ironing. I'm all upset. And um, Austin, this is right when she learned to talk. Austin came waddling in and um, I'm sitting there, and I remember in my insecurity saying this to God. I said, God, when are you going to make me great? <laughs> so stupid now that I think about it. Like, God, when are you going to do that in my life? And Austin's pulling on my, on my pant leg, and I'm like, Austin, not now, I'm busy. I'm ironing, I'm being all bitter. And um, she's like, dad, 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 dad. And I'm like, not now, I'm busy. And uh, I heard God tell me this so clear. He said, oh, son. He said, you're sitting here asking me when I'm going to make you great, and I'm sitting here showing you how I'm going to make you great. See, here, see, here's the thing. Here's what you got to understand. Success to us isn't always what success looks like in the kingdom. You know what success looks like in the kingdom? Just being faithful and obedient. Just be faithful with what God's asked you to do. You're all with me? Okay, so he, he didn't bow down. So what are you bowing down to? Fear, insecurity. I wrote a few things down. Popularity. That's a dangerous throne to bow down in front of. Public opinion. So he goes to, the, goes to the courtroom and they send him to the cross. I, I, I was raised in a certain denomination. I was, I was raised Baptist, I'll just tell you. So all my points have to start with the same letter. It's just this, this thing that we do. Anyways, okay, so I had the confrontation in the court and then we're going to the cross. Okay, so here we go. Um, 
so Jesus is hanging on the cross and nailing to the cross, right? We're going somewhere, students. We're going, I promise. So we're all thinking, what does this have to do with curses? We're going, okay? Um, so he's hanging on the cross, and there were people who would look at him and they'd say, man, this guy can came, come down and just save himself. Why didn't he just call on angels to save himself? And when I grew up and I was y'all's age, I thought, yeah, absolutely. Why didn't he just do that? Like he had already suffered enough to show us that he loves us. Why didn't he just come off the cross? Here's the thing. If he would have come off the cross, you would still be lost. Right? There had to be a death penalty on your behalf. Let me tell you this, students. Just like Jesus didn't come off the cross, let me tell you, don't come off your cross too soon. Don't Listen, there's a temptation when we're going through suffering, when we're going through something bad, when we're going through a trial, just to get out of it as quick as we can. And I'm a, I'm a man, if anything, if I err on any side, I err on the side of God is good, and uh, He doesn't curse people with cancer and do all those things. I, I, I err on that side if I'm going to err on anything. But there are times when there is a purpose to your pain. Right? There, is a, there is a time when there is a purpose to your pain. Don't come off your cross too soon. Because here's the thing, if he wouldn't have had that, resur- uh, that uh, crucifixion, he wouldn't have had a resurrection. And sometimes God lets you have a public crucifixion so that you can have a public resurrection. So he's hanging on this cross. Here's what happens. He says, I thirst, I'm thirsty. And so one of the guards goes and he gets some bitter wine, puts it on a sponge and lifts it up to his mouth. And it said that Jesus tasted it and he, he, he rejected it. Can I tell you this? Jesus' last obstacle before his greatest breakthrough was bitterness. Listen, don't let bitterness keep you from your breakthrough. You know how I know you're probably bitter? Because this is, this is my indicator. Have you ever been walking through Walmart and you see someone you hate? And so you do everything you can not to interact with that person. But while you're walking through your Walmart, you're thinking, I wish he would have said something to me. Because if he said this... I would have said this. And then he would have said this back. And I would have said this. And all of a sudden, you're upset about a conversation that hasn't even happened. Oh, I'm the only one. You're going to be judgmental. Just throw the stones. And and you're upset about something that hadn't even happened. That's how you know you're... That's bitterness. Listen, don't let bitterness keep you from your breakthrough. I want to suggest to you that when you're bitter, you are moments away from your breakthrough. Reject the bitterness. Reject it. So here's what happened next. Jesus is hanging on the cross. And I've been thinking through this just the past couple weeks. I've been thinking of how to share this next point. You had Jesus in the middle and you had two thieves on the side. Jesus was a king. There were two thieves on the side of Jesus. And I've been thinking through this. What if there were more than two thieves hanging up there? What if there were actually three? Because here's the thing, there were two people up there that robbed people, but the guy in the middle was fixing to rob death. And then I thought, let's take it the other way. And I thought this, what if there was more than one king hanging up there? What if the king in the middle was royalty, but the two rebels on his side just didn't know they were kings yet? I don't know which one I like more. But here's the thing. May, listen, maybe, that, maybe that's the whole point of the cross is he turns rebels into royalty. Right? Because here's the thing about religious people. Religious people love to label you based on what you've done. So we look at this and we say, oh, they were thieves because that's what they do. They steal things. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. They're royalty. Why? Because he doesn't, he doesn't look at what you've done. He looks at what he's done. Right? So we live in this lie that we think, oh man, we give our life to Jesus and um, we have our personal relationship with God. Right? That's why I grew up thinking I had this personal relationship with God. Here's the truth. You don't have a personal relationship with God. You have Jesus' relationship with God. So when he looks, because here's the thing, if he looks at me and still sees Nathan, I'm in big trouble. But when he looks at me and see, sees Nathan covered in Jesus, that's what, you know what that's called? That's called righteousness. When he looks at you, he doesn't see your sin. He sees his son. He doesn't see your depression. He sees his daughter. I ran out of words. I came up with this. I'll just come back over here to my computer. So here we go. So confrontation. He went to the court. He went to the cross. And now we're dealing with the curse. So before Jesus was hung on the cross, you remember 
that there were guards who put something on his head. Do you remember what that was made out of? Thorns. Hmm. You remember in Genesis? It says this. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your lives. Thorns and thistles it will bring forth for you. One of the results of sin was thorns. It was the curse. Thorns represented the curse. And here you have these guards. Students, follow me here. Let me see your eyes. Here you have these guards making a crown out of the curse. Making a crown out of the thing that was supposed to be a curse. And here you have a king wearing it on your behalf. See, that's what Calvary did. It turned curses into crowns. Come on, student. If you hadn't heard anything I've said tonight, you've got to hear this. That's what the cross did. It turned your curse into a crown. Because here's the thing. It wasn't just the weight of everyone's sin that he was carrying. You've got to think personally. It was your sin he was carrying. Right? It was your sin that was on him. So it was my, co- my cocaine addiction that he wore on the cross. Right? It was my lust issues that he wore on the cross. It was my pride that was placed upon him. Are y'all, tra- are y'all track with me? I mean, I could tell you some of y'all sins because Adam's been telling me some of you what y'all are. But I don't want to go there. Listen, Calvary turns curses into crowns. So here's the thing. There's two types of curses I want to deal with real quick. We've got a few minutes. There are two types of curses. There are curses that you bring upon yourself through a thing called stupidity. Right? I, I, I'm a, I'm a, this is why I like traveling. I can't do what Pastor Mark does. I don't think I could ever do it because I'm a terrible counselor. Okay, I like coming and preaching and then counseling's not my thing. My, my advice for whenever I cancel is like, bro, just quit being an idiot. And that's not very pastoral, okay? But, but here's the thing. A lot of the things we go through aren't, aren't a result of you being persecuted. It's a result of you made a really bad decision. Right? And God's not cursing you for it. You're cursing yourself because you made a really bad decision. So there's that type of curse that's going to be broken tonight. But then there's this other curse. And it's, it's, it's curses that other people put on you. Can I tell you all a story real quick? This is like my, one of my favorite stories. Um, how many of you live that, uh, know that we still live in a day um, that is full of darkness, full of spiritual darkness, full of witchcraft, full of demons? I don't know how people read the Bible and they think that stuff just went away. It blows my mind. But here's the thing. That stuff is still real. So a few years ago, my parents used to live down in Mexico, like old Mexico. Um, they were missionaries down there, and they had just moved down there. And I flew back to stay in their house before it sold. So it was an empty house, and I stayed there for free um, because that's being smart. Um, you You'll get it. Some of you college kids will get it later. So I stay there for free. Well, I'm, I, I'm an uh, insomniac. Anybody knows that, know what that means? It means I, like I'm up all the time. So I'm like walking through the living room like 2.30 in the morning, and we had this big bay window, right? Yeah, bay, like it's big window. I mean, I walk by it, and I see some people standing out in my front yard. It's 2.30 in the morning. And I think, what the junk? Like, I was like, what? And here's the weird thing. There were five of them. They were all standing in a row looking at my house. And they're all wearing black. And I, I was, I'm not even Catholic. I was crossing myself. I was like, huh? I went and got a bunch of Bill Johnson books and I was throwing them out. No, I didn't. I didn't. Um, so, listen, I was like, what's going on? And so, I'm like, okay, I got to be a man. Okay, I got to scare him off. So I opened the, I cracked the door. And I tried to yell, no, don't laugh. I tried to yell this in a really manly voice. But have you ever tried to say something in a deep voice and it just doesn't come out the way you plan? I meant to say, I meant to say, hey. And what I really said was, hey. And I was like, oh, stupid. I was like, oh, dang it. I can't even, be, I can't even scare these people. I was like, do y'all need something? And um, whenever I said that, this is what happened next. Whenever I said that, they all circle up in the middle of my yard. And I was like, it's about to go down. <laughs> right? I Listen, I love Jesus, but I will shoot someone if I have to. Um, like in the leg. Like, I don't want to kill him. But um, I was like, what's going on? And then one by one, this is 2.30 in the morning. One by one, they start to walk off out of the circle. They go four houses down and do the same thing in that yard. And so I do what we all do during times of crisis, right? I started tweeting, okay? Right? Because that's what you do when you're... Twitter, okay? 
So I get on Twitter and I'm like saying, there were some people in my yard, it was crazy. And the next day, my mailman, I, I'm, I've got to point to this story, I promise. My mailman comes to my office and he's like, bro, can I talk to you? I was like, yeah. And he shuts the door and um, he was like, I, I saw your tweet about what happened last night. He said, which way did they walk? And I said, they walked to the east. He said, four houses down? I said, yeah, because he's my mailman. He knows where I live. I said, four houses? He said, yeah, four houses down. He said, bro, that's where my pastors live. In the past few weeks, they've been going over there, and they've been having these rituals in their yard, and they've been leaving dead cats. Listen, some of y'all that, listen, some of you that, you're like, oh my gosh, that's so scary. That fired me up, bro. When I heard that, I was like, tell them to come on back. I was like, witches get stitches. You tell them what's up. I was like, I'm ready. I was like, come on. Because here's the thing, you got to get this. They're over there messing with, bloods of cat, with the blood of cats, but I'm covered in the blood of a lamb. So listen, you can throw a curse at me all you want to. Listen, you can throw it at me all you want to. I'm ready. I was fired up. I was like, oh, man, I went looking for him, 2.30 and not. But there's, there's curses that you bring on yourself, but there's curses that other people bring on you too. Here's the good news about both of them. The blood broke both of them. Notice I said broke, not is going to break. Whatever you're struggling with tonight, it's already been taken care of. Jesus doesn't have to show up and unlock your chains. Your chains have been broken. You just don't know it yet. Where's Mir- Mirna, right? Mirna, come up. Mirna's going to come back up here. It's this, she's going to play the piano. It's this trick we pastors do to make things real emotional in the room. So I'm just going to let y'all know. Watch. She's going to start playing here. But... So, th- but this isn't where the story ends. Give me five minutes, I'll be done, I promise. I'm one of those pe- pastors that says five minutes, and I really mean 55 minutes. Um, give me five minutes, I'll be done, I promise. So here's what, you felt it, huh? Right there, right in the fields. Listen, here's the thing. That's not where the story ended, right? So Jesus died on the cross, but the story, we pick it up three days later. You got your Bibles? Flip over, because I want you to see this so you know I'm not lying. Go to John 19. Go to John chapter 19. here's the crazy thing they put Jesus in a tomb right everyone's upset they thought he had forsaken him they thought he was gone and here comes Mary to the tomb now here's the thing students you got to get this don't miss this this will change your life Mary showed up to the tomb to pay her respects right she she showed up to the tomb of a dead man to pay her respects I don't think she was expecting a resurrection. Let me ask you this. I wonder if on Wednesdays we show up just to pay our respects to a guy that we think is still dead. Or I wonder if someone showed up tonight expecting a resurrection. Y'all didn't hear me. I'll say it again. I got time. I wonder how many of us showed up just out of respect, you know, Jesus, he supposedly died for me. He was a really good guy that once lived. Let me tell you, Jesus is no longer dead. That's the truest thing I've said all night, right? He is alive at this moment. Not only is he alive, he's here in the room. And what's fixing to happen in the room isn't um, a result of good worship. It's not a result of preaching or anything like that. What's fixing to happen in the room is something that only this guy can do. Right? I can't bring you back to life. I wish I could. That'd be, I went to Bethel. I can't even do it. Okay? So I only went one year, though. I should have gone three. Um, that's why I promise. So listen. So here's Jesus. Jesus is the only one that can resurrect. So I will see. This is why I love traveling and speaking. Because I love looking at your faces. And some of you have no idea what's fixing to happen to you. And I love it. Because here in about five minutes, you're going to be messed up. Can I say messed up here? Yeah, you're going to be messed up. Because God is fixing to resurrect some things in your life. You thought some things were dead, and God is fixing to resurrect them. Some things that have been sick in you are fixing to get healed. Listen, some of you don't know Jesus. You don't know this, this God of love. You just know this God that's really hateful, and if you don't pray to him, he'll send you to hell. Listen, that's not what Jesus is about. God is love. And some of you don't know anything about that. So you, listen, some of you are getting to, uh, fixing to come out of your tombs. But here's what you got to get. Jesus resurrects. Mary shows up. And look at look what happens. We got those verses. Okay, look. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. 
and she said, uh, the body of Jesus, oh, oh, you messed me up there. Okay, but, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb and she wept as she stooped to look into the tomb. So she's looking for um, life in a dead place. Okay, look at this. And she, and she saw two angels uh, in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said, watch this, here we go. Having said this, she turned around. Oh, <laughs> woo, having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know it was Jesus. So here, listen, you remember in the garden, the first Adam, he messed everything up. One of the names for Jesus is the second Adam. Because what the first Adam messed up, the second Adam had to fix. So watch this. Having seen this, she turned around and saw... Um, go back for me real quick. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was her. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Watch this. Supposing him to be the what? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, in Aramaic Rabbani, which means teacher. Listen, so remember, she turns to him and she thinks that he's the gardener. I want to suggest to you that she was actually right the first time she guessed who he was. Because you remember the first Adam turned the garden into a graveyard but the second Adam showed up and turned the graveyard into a garden because here's what happened when Jesus resurrected scripture says that hundreds of other tombs resurrected as well and dead people just started walking around can you imagine what that looked like but let me tell you that's a result of being with Jesus let me tell you if you need a resurrection you just better get where Jesus is I can't do it. Adam can't do it. Pastor Mark can't do it. Only Jesus, Jesus is the great gardener that will take something out of the ground. And whatever comes out of the ground is better than what went in. Come on, students. Hey, why don't you stand with me? So only Jesus can turn these curses into crowns. And here's where I want to, I think I want to go with this. Is we're going to do some ministry time. We've got a few minutes left. I, I would be a fool to not let Jesus minister to you tonight. But if you would say this, if you would say, Nathan, I'm living with some curses. I'm living with either some curses that people have put on me. Maybe your dad has told you you're worthless and that was a word curse that's been put on you. And because he said it, that's the way you view yourself as worthless. Listen, that's fixing to be broken. Maybe it's a curse you put on yourself through your own stupidity, right? You just did something dumb and now you can't live it down. Listen, I've done some dumb things, right? I've done some dumb things, but I know this. Only God can bring life to those situations. And so here's what I'm going to do with the lights, you know, still on. I'm not going to ask you to bow your head to close your eyes. And here's why I'm not going to do that. Whenever I got married to my fine wife, right? Give me a... <clears throat> Calm down, bro. Okay. Like, whenever I got married and we were saying our vows together, I didn't turn to everyone and say, if y'all would just bow your heads and close your eyes. No, I didn't do that because I wanted to see how this sucker got someone this fine. Right? I was proud of what was fixing to happen. I wanted everyone to see it. The same thing happens here. We're family, right? This is a family. And sometimes we all bow our heads and close our eyes and we try to kill Goliath in private. And God's saying, no, I want to kill Goliath in public. I want people to see it happen. And so if you would say this, if you would say, man, I'm living under a word curse, I'm living under, I feel like I'm living under some curses that you need to be broken, or you're saying, listen, I've just done some dumb things that I need God to come and set me free from. Would you do this? Would you just come up to the altar? Right now, wherever you are, just come up to the altar. Come on, come on, come on. Don't wait, don't wait, don't wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. Listen, this is this is why you came tonight. Was for this moment right here. Don't miss it.
I get up here, is it going to mess it up if I walk up there? Hey, y'all turn and face me. Y'all come right here to the middle and turn and face me. Let's fill just right this, this little middle space right here. Now, honest, now don't lie. How many of you thought you were going to be the only one that came up here? <laughs> That's what I love, is it's the moment when we realize, oh, we all struggle. Right? It's the moment where we realize, oh, you're struggling too. I'm struggling too. Listen, this is revival right here. It's a product of Jesus doing this. I didn't do this. Jesus did it. And so we're going to pray. And, and if, we, if Adam, if you've got leaders or any adults in the room, if y'all, while we're praying, if y'all would just go through here to lay hands on some, some, some people, we're just going to pray for you. And here's the thing. God is going to set you free. Listen, God's the only one that can do that. God's going to set you free. But here's the thing. It's up to you on whether or not you want to stay free. It's not some magic prayer I'm praying. It's Jesus showing up in the middle of your, your tomb and pulling you out. So can we do this? Can you just put your hand over your heart? Just as a symbol of God, I want you to come and remove these things out of my heart. God, I want you to come and remove this pride, remove this jealousy, remove this hatred. And I'm going to pray. God, we thank you for what you've done. God, we thank you that you are the great gardener. God, that you pull these things out of the ground, that you develop our dirt. God, the things that we're struggling with, God, the things that we're trying to hide, we thank you that right now you're healing us of. God, we lift the rug up. We're showing you our dirt. And we're saying, God, come and take this. Come and take this and turn it into something powerful. So God, I pray for every student and every adult from the front of the room to the back of the room that right now, those chains would be broken. God, that you would fill them with supernatural power. Come on, students, I want you to pray with me. Even if the only thing you're saying is the name of Jesus. Listen, that is the most powerful thing you could ever pray is just his name. So as I'm praying, just begin to speak out the name of Jesus. God, I thank you for what you're doing. Come on, students, I want you to put his name on your tongue. Jesus, God, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you've done. Come and fill these students. God, come and pull dead things out of tombs. So God, we break every curse that we've put on ourselves. God, we break the word curses that, that other people have, have put on us. God, for the people who have had fathers who have, who have spoken bad things over them, God, we just break that and we, we just say, God, that you are a good father and you speak good things over your children. God, for the people who are just struggling with addiction, God, I pray that addiction would bow its knee right now to the name of Jesus from the front of the room to the back of the room. God, I pray for every person in the room that's struggling with sickness, God, that tonight they would be healed. 100% from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet, God. And I hear God saying this. God, right, this is what I hear God saying. God is healing depression. I struggle with depression on and off for my entire life. Right now, God is healing depression. If you're struggling with depression, this, this is for you. God, we just pray that you would remove that depression and that you would come and fill us with hope. Put hope in our hearts. God, we just pray that that cloud that seems to follow us everywhere, God, that it would no longer be a cloud of depression. It would be a cloud of your Holy Spirit that you would rain down in every one of our circumstances. God, fill us up. Fill us up, God. You're the only one that can do it. God, we thank you that you turn graveyards into gardens. I just saw you sitting over there um, by yourself and I was almost going to like come and talk to you and try to get you to come over here and God said something to me. He said, no, 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 I've set her apart for a reason. Um, it's not just a, like a seating arrangement, right? God's doing something special in your life where sometimes in order for God to do some things in your life, you have to come out of the crowd and it wasn't by chance that you were sitting over there by yourself. God hasn't forgotten you. God's not mad at you. God has a plan for your life. So you've got to trust him. He's not going to hurt you like other people have hurt you in your life. He's not going to forsake you like other people have forsaken you in your life. He has good plans for you. And he's turning you into a leader. He's developing your dirt. Don't be afraid of it. 
He's doing powerful things in your life. All right, Adam. That's all I got. Hey, listen. Look at me. I'm super proud of you. Can I tell you it takes courage to come and do this? Right? It takes courage to step out of your comfort zone, step out of your seat and say, God, I need you. I need you. I need you to set me free. I need you to do this. And so I know I'm not your father, but I, I, I want to step into that father role and look at all of you in the eye and say, listen, I'm proud of you. God is going to do something in your life and it's going to be special. Amen.